It is good to see you uh, today. And we do pray that you have had a, a good Thanksgiving, and I know many of you helped other people to have good Thanksgivings uh, around in various places. We had a good Thanksgiving. I can't help but uh, some of the songs we sing, and you know, they ha you have memories. You know, that song that you guys did there, that last, not, not that one, but the one, the Indian song. Yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah. You know, I got, when I got saved, I, I didn't know anything. And so I'd been going to Dog Ear Crump's church for a while, and I was uh, single. But I already, had, I already knew what I was going to do, but I, I wasn't spreading it around. I, I knew that I was going to go. See, I, 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 I had seen Karen when she was younger in high school. I didn't talk to her because I was a pagan and she was a, a Christian girl. And, you know, I, you know, just didn't talk to them. You know, and what's the use, right? When you're pagan, why well, talk to Christian girls? <laughs> but, so I already planned, I already knew. When I can get acceptable, <laughs> I'm going to go up there and get her and marry her. I mean, I already had the plan made. I already had the plan made. I really did, I, you know, because I've always been a planner. But I was in Dog Ears Church, and so, you know, you're young and you're single, and so what do church people do? You need to go to this singles gathering, you know, because they try to marry you. All of you that are single here and you were in church when you were younger, you know the older people tried to get you married off just as quick as they could, right? I want you to meet so-and-so. You need to meet me. Y'all ever had that experience? You know, so this dog and all these ladies and church, you need to go to this meeting with all these single Christians. Yeah. All right. So it's like sending Genghis Khan, you know, to sit with Gandhi. And so, you know, so I go to the thing, and uh, my music had been Led Zeppelin, Credence Clearwater, you know, all that stuff. All them people all those years. Stephen Wolf, born to be wild, baby. You know, so I go to this thing, and it's about, you know, I don't know, two, three hundred singles. So I'm there, and they did sing that song, and I thought, well, that's pretty good. That, you know, Indian song, all right. Okay, this is great. And so and they had this young guy speaking. He's speaking, you know, all about stuff, you know, that I didn't even relate to. I'm standing there thinking, they like what? <laughs> you know, just all kind of this mushy stuff, you know. <laughs> you gotta understand my brain was not not, you know, fixed yet. <laughs> it's still not, right? My children say, it ain't now, it ain't now. <laughs> but so at the end of that thing though, this is how I knew I wasn't going anymore with them. They all got up and they sang this song, and I remember the name of this one, it was Kumbaya. And they all started hanging on one another and hugging each other. And these guys are squalling. They grab, and I'm going like this. <laughs> and I knew right then, when I get out of here, I'm going to go get that girl and marry her. I ain't coming to no more of these things. Because <laughs> I ain't going through this mess. <laughs> you know? But I like that Indian song. That is a great, great, great song. But I never did sing Kumbaya very good. You know, <laughs> that, that just never did work for me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, and all this, you know, <laughs> don't that give you a little, you know, when guys start just, and they all squalling, you think, ooh. <laughs> it was hard for me, okay? <laughs> but, but it's been a good weekend. I've enjoyed it with the family. And, you know, of course, TJ got to come in, and well, his job situation's changed. He's no longer having to run around the world with the president. He got to uh, come in for Thanksgiving holiday, and, and uh, now he's working for the FBI, and so he, he got to come in, and, and, uh, but we had to take him back. He had to get back, you know, because government never sleeps, right? So they have to get back and all that kind of stuff, and, and uh, he's trying to go to school too. And so Stephen and TJ and I drove just on the outskirts of, of D.C., you know, there in Was the Washington suburbs, of, you know, the Washington suburbs, or Northern Virginia, right? That's what it is. So we take him up there. And so I, you know, I think, we're getting up real early, boy, and driving home. 
So I said, okay, Stephen, I'm get a shower. I'm going to get ready. I'm going to go to bed. You go to bed get some sleep. So I got ready. I went to bed. They're in there. And you know what they're doing? Playing video games. So I'm laying there in the bed, and they're making noise like when they were kids. And I'm thinking, now one of them boys in there has guarded the president, and I ain't worked for the FBI. The other one is fixing to be a doctor of pharmacy, and they still playing video games. I said, nothing has changed in life. And so I got another pillar and covered my head up and went to sleep. You know. But some things don't change, right? No matter how big they get, they still are what, mommy? Kids. And that's why I see some of you mothers, I saw this one right here not long back, we still call them babies, no matter, what, what was that one, one of y'all put on Facebook, even if he's six foot so-and-so and weighs 200, so, oh, it was you. What, it, it, we still call them our babies. And, I thought, and you know that's true. Yeah, yeah. But the next time we're going to drive home, go to bed. Because <laughs> about the time we were driving home, we got to Cold Pepper, Virginia. He fell asleep. I said, you want me to drive some? So I drove us home. I thought, I got to get home. You know? Yeah. He said, Paul, oh, how is it that you're able to sleep? You, ne you never sleep. And I said, I'm Abby Normal, baby. Abby Normal. I want you to take your Bible and turn to Joshua. We're going to look at two chapters quickly. Joshua 6 and 7. Got to go fast. We're not going to read all of it. But I want to talk to you about mercy and judgment here. Listen uh, to this, if you will. Mercy and and judgment. Now, if you'll remember, last week we talked about Rahab, right? And the fact that even though she had lived a life, a life of a lady of ill repute, God's grace was sufficient to save her. No matter what was going on in her life, no matter how she had lived as a Canaanite woman, God saved her because she did what? She believed in God. She put her trust in God. She was repentant toward God and believed. She was a believer. She knew that God was going to take Jericho, and she wanted to have life rather than judgment. And she talked to those spies that came there about that, and they did tell her, if you will do what you say, and you'll take care of us, then we will make sure that you survive. And this is the second part of that story here, just a little bit uh, right here in the sixth chapter of the book of Joshua. Let me pray with you. Father, we again thank you for loving us and caring for us and doing all the stuff that you do. And we ask you now to use your word in these next few minutes to touch and change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, uh, don't forget this. In the sixth chapter, uh, we find these words. I'm going to read a couple of verses and I'll I'll touch on these chapters a little bit as we go. It says, now Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. If you'll remember, uh, they knew that Israel was going to come. And God had been giving every nation that they ran into coming in toward the promised land, they get, God had given them victory. And they had wiped out all kinds of kings, all kinds of cities. They uh, defeated the the, the king, of, of you know, remember I talked to you about this last week, Og, and he was a, a great king, but Israel just walked through him like a knife through hot butter. I mean, it was amazing what God was doing. Jericho knew that the Israelites are outside the gate. So they did everything they could, everything they could do. They fortified everything they could fortify. They shut the city down. Nobody was going out in hopes that somehow they would survive. But here's the deal, folks. When God intends to move, nothing can stand against God. That's a fact. <coughs> so going on here, it says, No one went out and no one came in. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand. Now they hadn't done a thing yet, but God had said it's over for them. Judgment's come to Jericho. <coughs> Excuse me, and when you read the Old Testament, you find that God said judgment has come to the disobedient. That's why he was wiping these people out. Sometimes people say, why had all that happened? See, we don't know all the story, but obviously God had dealt with Jericho. Jericho had rebelled against God, and God had determined in his plan, in God's providence, in God's sovereignty, 
It's over for Jericho. It's over. It's, it's, the end is here. Judgment has come. So he told them he was going to give them the king and all of its valiant warriors, everything. And Jericho was a powerful, powerful city. <coughs> so, going on with this story, God uh, told him exactly what you're going to do. He said, what? This is an amazing war strategy. You're going to march around the city seven times. Just march around the city, boys. And on the seventh time, seventh day, you're going to march seven times around. Y'all all have sang that song. As a matter of fact, some of you are singing it right now, right? Right? Joshua fit the battle of Jericho. Y'all, right. Okay. So that's what they did. And, and, and in the sixth verse of the sixth chapter, it says, So Joshua... Son of Nun called the priest and said, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And then he told the people, Go forward and march around the city and let the armed men go on before the Ark of the Lord. So you know what they were doing uh, there. Now, God was about to destroy Jericho. But in this story, there is the story of God's grace in completion with Rahab, Rahab the harlot. We find that very, very plainly here what God was going to do. God was going to spare Rahab because what had there been? There had been a promise between the two spies. One of them's name, if you'll remember, was Salmon. And later on, Salmon will marry Rahab, and you know, Rahab is then in the lineage of Jesus himself. You know, all of that uh, story we talked about uh, that last week. So, here they go. Here's judgment coming to Jericho, but at the same time, grace is coming to Rahab. All right? And that's the way the world has been from the beginning. You see God bringing judgment here and grace here. God doing this here in His sovereignty and something else over here in that same sovereignty. Because we need to understand something about God that's very serious. And I think in our culture, sometimes we forget this. As a matter of fact, if you read anything, if you read uh, any religious writings, if you listen to a lot of sermons, you find out that a lot of people are forgetting something about the nature of God. Oftentimes we talk about a loving God, and God is a loving God. There is no question about that. If God did not love mankind, He definitely would not have sent Jesus to die for our sin, right? That would not have happened. God's grace is sufficient. But at the same time, we need to understand that because God is sovereign and God is holy and He is just and righteous in all His ways, equally, just as God is a loving God, a God of love, God is also equally a God of wrath and judgment. God is in perfect balance. There is the love of God and there is the wrath of God. And sometimes in our culture, we forget that there is the judgment of God. Even in the household of faith, sometimes we forget there is the judgment of God. We forget that. And this is a story of both grace, mercy if you will, and judgment at the same time. Never forget this though, God's grace is sufficient to save any person who will recognize what? That he or she has sinned against God and every one of us, every person ever born, other than Jesus himself, who is God, has done what? Sin and fallen short of the glory of God. We are sinners from birth. Now, we didn't begin to be sinners at birth. We were sinners at birth. In other words, I am telling you, the Scripture teaches us very plainly, we are born into with depravity. We are a depraved people. I was telling some of my children this week, nobody ever had to tell you to do wrong. We were having one of those deep conversations, you know, like down Saturday Night Life, deep thoughts. Deep conversations. Nobody ever had to tell you how to do wrong. 
And that's true with every one of us, right? Why is that? It's because we are sinners at birth, not from birth. We're born sinners. We're ready to go. We've got everything in us needed to be sinful. We're born with that sin nature about us. But God's grace is sufficient to save any person who realizes, who comes to recognize that they have sinned, not against mommy, not against daddy, brother, sister, uncle, or cousin, or the school teacher, or the principal, or the vice principal of whatever you guys are, but against a holy God. Sin, our sin, is primarily against holy God. And if we repent of sin, truly repent, what is called in the Bible, godly sorrow, true repentance, and believe the gospel, then we can be saved. Now what do you mean when you say believe the gospel? <coughs> Does that mean if I declare I'll be good? God, please forgive me and I'll be good from now on. You see those kind of prayers, you know, and sometimes you read those kind of prayers and you see somebody in a commercial or a movie or something say, God, if you'll get me out of this, I promise to go to church from now on. That does not save you. Does that save you? That will not save you. That will not save you. You are saved because you repent of sin and believe the biblical gospel. What do you mean by the biblical gospel? Just like I said, you know that you're a sinner from birth, right? Sin is something God hates. God hates it. God does not laugh about it. God does not laugh at the jokes about sin that people tell. He, doesn't laugh. he hates it. And quickly, the core of the gospel, not the entire gospel story, because the entire gospel story goes from the first verse in Genesis to the last verse in the Revelation, but the core of the gospel is this. Because we are sinners, Jesus did die for us, and that was decreed from the foundations of the world even before that Christ would die for sinners and Jesus did die for sinners and then he was buried and he rose from the grave and not only did he rise from the grave but he appeared to a multitude of people and then rose up into the heavens he he ascended into the heavens and he is at the right hand of God and he calls every day men women boys and girls to repent of sin and trust in His vicarious death and atonement to save us from our sins. And our salvation is in Christ alone. Do you believe that? So you can't say, Mama, I'm going to be good from now on so I can go to heaven. You'll go to hell doing that. It's in Christ and Christ alone. This woman's story is unbelievable listen to this God said the city shall be under the ban meaning you destroy everything there wipe it out take it off the face of the earth listen to it in the 17th verse the city shall be under the ban and it and all of the land all that is in it belongs to the Lord only Rahab the harlot and all who are with her in the house shall live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But as for you, only keep yourselves from the things under the ban so that you do not covet them and take some things away that are under the ban and make the camp of Israel accursed and bring trouble on it. But the silver and the gold and articles of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord, they shall go into the treasury of the Lord. And then you know what happens. God's people came in after they marched around those seven times on that seventh day and everything went chaotic there and then they went into the city and they were destroying everything. And the 22nd verse of the 6th chapter says, Joshua said, Joshua who was in charge, Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, Go into the harlot's house and bring the woman and all she has out of there as you have sworn to her. Because there was a covenant there. 
So the young men who were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers and all she had. They also brought out all her relatives and placed them outside the camp of Israel. And then they burned the city with fire. They burned the town down, boys. Now we think that's mighty hard, right? In today's culture, we think that's not acceptable. There should have been something else done. We can't call it that. We have new words for sin, right? And I'll not get into all that, but you know I'm right. God said burn it down. Why? Because God had judged Jericho. Judgment was at the gates of Jericho. There was no second chance anymore. It was over, except for this one woman and her family. So it was totally destroyed. That's grace. God's grace was sufficient to save Rahab because she had done one thing. Not that she was always good, because she was not. She was a prostitute and, and ran a house of ill repute. She was a Canaanite. She was of an ungodly people. But because she believed, God did what? Wiped all that out. He did not hold that to her account. And he spared her life. Her life and the lives of all her family members were under the grace of God. That's God's grace. God's grace is sufficient, right? Aren't you glad of that? Aren't you happy about that today? That God's grace is sufficient to save you? That no matter what has happened, God will save you? But at the same time, do not forget that there is the judgment of God. And then there's this next story. Quickly, listen. In the seventh chapter, just like you find grace in the sixth chapter, you find the judgment of God in the seventh chapter. Now people look at the seventh chapter, a lot of scholars, and they say, that didn't happen. God would never do that. Yes, he did. It's just like today people are saying, God, God will not send anyone to hell. Yes, people go to hell. People go to hell. Men, women, boys, and girls go to hell who have not repented and believed the gospel. Listen to this. Seventh chapter. Boy, they had defeated Jericho. Big city. Tough king. Bad boys. Good army. Walk through them. Didn't lose a man. As you might say sometimes, you know, you see in them movies, didn't fire a shot. We won! They had their victory party. Seventh chapter comes. But the sons, in first verse, sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regard to the things under the ban. Remember, God said, kill everybody, destroy everything. There are some things that I need for my treasury. You bring me that. You don't keep anything. Watch. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, Zabdi, the son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, the chosen tribe of Israel, from which Jesus would come, took some of the things under the ban. Therefore the anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. <coughs> well, that's terrible, isn't it? God was, what? Angry. See, we don't want to talk about an angry God. But the scripture says it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Right? There is God's anger. And it is as balanced, it is as real, if you will, as God's love and mercy and long-suffering. And this says, this angered God. I mean, he had given them great grace. No one died. They took this great Jericho, hands down, so to speak, just marching around, singing and jumping. And they won. And God even showed how gracious he was by saving one of the Canaanites. Now, God was looking down on them, but here in the second verse, Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai. 
Now, Ai was a little bitty place. It was not much. It was not Jericho. It was just a little bitty, as we might could say, hole-in-the-wall place, okay? You ever heard of that? It's just a hole in the wall. Some of y'all say that sometimes, and I, and I, and I rebuke you when you do it, right? So don't, don't say that. Don't say that. But it was, just, it was nothing compared to Jericho. Ai. And God sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Avon, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. So they went up and spied out the land. Long story short, they come back and said, Man, it ain't nothing. Josh, we can take that place easy. You don't even need to send a bunch of guys. We'll go down there and whoop them. It's our baby, you know. It's ours, you know. We'll take them. Like you boys did to old Louisville yesterday. <laughs> I'm proud of you, buddy. I'm tired of them shooting their mouths off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Don't shoot your mouth off if you can't really play. Listen. Listen. We can take them. So Joshua said, well, take about 3,000 boys down there and go whoop them. So they can mark. You can see them. They're as cocky as they can be, right? I mean, we got this. We got this. Sound like ball players, don't you? We got this, coach. We got it. Don't worry about it. They go down to AI, and they, AI whipped them like little dogs and sent them running home to their mama. That really happened. It's right here, seventh chapter. I mean, they just whipped them bad. The men of AI struck down about 36 of their men and pursued them from the gate as far as Shabarim and struck them down on the descent. Boy, I mean, they were just slaughtering them. And when Joshua hears this, he tears his clothes and he fell down to the earth before the ark of the Lord until the evening. And he and the elders, and he said, Lord God, why did you ever bring this people over the Jordan only to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites? He just is squalling. God, why'd you let this happen? Why'd you let this happen, Lord? You know what God really said? It's in the 10th verse, but most translations don't get it right. God said, shut up. Literally, this is the real translation. Shut up. Act like a man. Stand up. That's exactly what God said. Listen to this, to the 10th verse. Rise up. Why is it that you have fallen on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, and have even taken some of the things under the ban, and have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have also put themselves, put them among their own things. And then he tells Joshua what to do. 13th verse, he says, Rise up, consecrate the people, and say, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, There are things under the ban in your midst. O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you have removed the things under the ban from your midst. In other words, you can't stand until you deal with your sin. And folks, that's applicable to us today. You know what? A lot of times we say we want God's blessings and we want God to do this and why don't God bring revival? You hear some people say, pray for revival! We need revival! And live like a rotten devil. Don't work. We need God in America! And then act like a pagan. It don't work. Because just like God said to them, he's still the same God today. What was God saying? Until you deal with this sin, this is not going to work for you. It's not going to happen. And God told them that. See, because God, just as he's a God of love, God's a God of judgment. See, this does away with this thing sometimes that we have in our culture. We say, you know, I'm not a bad person. I'm doing okay. My mommy's a Christian. My papa's a Christian. My Aunt Gracie Mae's a Christian, 
and they pray for me, I know I'm going to be okay. And sometimes mommy says, my babies are going to be all right. They're mine. As a matter of fact, I had a lady say to me one time, you know, I realize what the Bible says, and you know what's coming, the word's coming next, right? She said, but, I know God would never send one of my children to hell. That's a quote. Burned in my brain. I've forgotten a lot of stuff, but some things I don't forget. Because that knocks you back. Because why? Because that flies in the face of everything God is. Not everything the preacher is, but everything God has said. That walks over the blood of Jesus. That denies the necessity of the atonement. What is that really saying? That's saying, because he's my baby. The blood of Jesus is not necessary. In other words, my birthing him is superior than the atonement of Christ. That's what that's really saying, folks. That's why, listen, Mommy, listen, Daddy, we need to be praying, sometimes maybe face down, for our rebellious children. Now, three of mine are here. Well, they know that I, I believe this. They know it. And we say, honey, it don't matter what your name is. You do not know the cross. You will die lost and go to hell. We need to recognize that reality. That's just as true as the fact that Jesus was born in the manger that Jesus was hung on the cross to save sinners, it's just as true, right? When we sing all the songs we'll sing at Christmas time about Emmanuel, we need to understand that just as certain as did Jesus come to save any repentant soul who would believe the gospel, it is a fact that God will, will say, depart from me because I do not know you. 25th chapter of Matthew. Listen to me quickly here just for a moment. 31st verse, 25th chapter of Matthew. This is true, just as true as there's God's mercy that Rahab got. You know the story of Achan. What happened to Achan? Joshua went to him and said, Achan, confess, tell us what's happened. Because God pointed him out. God pointed him out. God's going to point us out. Philippians, the third chapter, says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, right? That's the judgment of God, folks. That's not preacher talk. See, sometimes I think we wipe this off by saying, ah, it's just a bunch of preacher talk. That's what they're supposed to say. Well, the problem I think we have is not enough for actually saying it anymore because they're afraid. People say, now you need to shut that up. If you're going to be a preacher here, you can't be saying that stuff. You're going to scare my kids. Honey, those kids need to be scared. Because there's a real hell. And you can party hardy all you want to, but if you don't know Jesus, you're going to hell. You can say, I'm okay. I like my life now. So did Achan. Achan liked his life now. You know what he said? He said, I, I took some stuff. He said, I saw this beautiful robe. It was from Brooks Brothers. I wanted it. He said, there was some silver and there was some gold there too. And in today's market, let me tell you how much that silver was worth. $200. In today's worth, you know how much the gold was worth? $500. So for a Brooks Brothers suit, $200 worth of silver and $500 worth of gold, this man gave up his life. Is it worth it? Now here's the thing, here's the thing. A lot of lost people say, I like my life now. They want the things in this world. They don't want to give those things up. I want to tell you something, it's not worth it because the rest of Aiken's story is what? Quickly stay with me. What is it? It's terrible. And we want to deny that it's in the Bible, but it's not. What happened to Aiken? Aiken confessed. Then they pulled out his whole family. Because the whole family was complicit in this because they hid it in their tent. 
and the people stoned them to death and then set them on fire. That happened. We say, that's terrible. Listen to Matthew. Jesus speaking. Matthew 25, 31. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed of My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then he goes on to speak about things that had happened to, to cause that to be. But then, what else happens? What then happens? Then he addresses those on the left. 41st verse. Then he will say to those on his left. These are the most terrible words in the scriptures, right here. Right here. These words. He says, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. That's judgment. That's forever. That's without end. Now, by the way, Achan did confess what he did, but it was too late. I quoted to you a verse a while ago from uh, Philippians 3. It says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. That's true. But for the great number of those that their knee will bow and the tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord, it will be too late. For it will be at the judgment seat of holy God. Everybody's going to confess. So here's the deal, folks. Here's reality. If a sinner will recognize now as the Holy Spirit speaks to him or speaks to her, I've, I've sinned against you, God, and I know it. God, please forgive me. And I, I, I know Jesus died for me. And I, I know He's risen from the dead and I know He's calling me and I know the power of the Holy Spirit is convicting me of my sin and I want Him to save me and, and repent and believe the gospel. God will save that sinner. But if you go on and reject God and reject God and reject God, the day will come just like it came for Jericho and just like it came for Achan. God will say, that's it. Oh, you'll confess. You'll even repent. You'll even try to make a deal, Scripture teaches. But it'll be too late. For there is the reality that God's mercy and grace shall not always continue with man, right? He's provided everything we need in Christ Jesus to be saved. And we need to understand this. My Christian friend, we need to understand this. And we need to stop being lax about talking to people about their eternal destination. And don't be talking to stuff anymore where you say, well, if I say anything to her, it'll drive her further away. You can't be further away than lost and on your way to hell. You can't be any further away than that. Now, when I say that, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. You don't grab somebody and put them in a headlock and beat them in the face and say, you low dog, you, you're going to hell. You better start acting like me. That don't work either. Okay? But with fear and trembling, we need to lovingly tell people, look, you're accountable before Jesus. 
and he does love you and he does want to save you and he does provide a way for you and you need to receive him you need to repent and surrender your life to him but if you don't no matter how much I pray no matter how much I agonize for you you're lost and you'll go to hell and don't come back and like so many people do and I've done I'm old now and I've done many 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 funerals and I've been around too much death even before I was saved I was around too much death and people die quick you know that Everybody does not get to die in a hospital bed, conscious and talking to all their friends, relatives, and loved ones. That don't happen. And nowadays, even when they do, they're so drugged up, they don't know where they are, right? Am I, am I right? You can die quick. It's quick. Sometimes we sit around in funeral homes and we say, well, maybe right before he hit that tree, he prayed and asked God to save him. Now, I know we say that, and we say that in all hope, and I don't rebuke you for saying that. But the odds are he didn't. And some of you in here that have had serious wrecks, I've had them. I wasn't thinking about God when I tore up vehicles. As a matter of fact, in one vehicle that I wrecked and tore all to pieces because it was the favorite vehicle I ever owned, when I saw that thing crashing into that bank, I was accustomed to high heaven, <laughs> mad. But in the good graces of God, told out my 442, but I come out of that thing without one scratch. Why? Only one reason. God was long-suffering, trying to give this sinful devil wretch an opportunity to be saved. I climbed out of the upside down of that car, still cussing and hollering and acting like a fool. Climbed up the bank, and I'll never forget, I don't know this lady's name, but they were stopping on, you know how people stop at Ray. I'm standing on the side of the road, cussing, hollering, acting like an idiot. And this older lady comes up to me and says, Son, don't you realize God had mercy on you? And I was such a stupid moron, I start cussing this woman. Oh, my car's tore up. Uh, you know, I, well, I ain't going to say that. It's shameful. I wasn't thinking about God. Thinking about a Texas yellow 442 with rolling pleated seats. That's all I was thinking about. What a fool! But Jesus even talked about that, didn't he? You remember that old boy in the Bible, New Testament, where he was a good farmer, he did really well, he put everything up. He said, You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to kick back, turn on a Kentucky ball. I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry because my barns are full and I'm happy as a pig in slop and I'm rocking and rolling. And God said, you fool. This night your soul shall be required of you. And that guy died. I've often thought about that with great shame. Here I was, a fool before holy God. If he had struck me with a lightning bolt and fried me like an egg on a spit, he would have every right to do that, right? Spared my sorry soul. And I didn't get saved the next day. I went on in my sins. I went home, got another vehicle, and just kept on being a hellion. But he spared me. But one day, it came to reality in my life, if I don't repent and believe the gospel, I'm going to hell. And I got saved. And I thank God for it all the time. Now, I know I've told you that story before, but listen. Don't you think that you can run this rabbit forever? You can't. <coughs> Excuse me, you can't. One day it's going to end. And judgment is absolute. And if you do not know Christ, you're lost. And the Bible says today is the day of salvation. And the Bible says whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. So if you know you're lost, and you will ask God to forgive you and believe the gospel. He really will save you. John, will you come? Ladies, listen to me. And my heart gets burdened more and more and more. I'm getting older. 
I was up real early this morning looking at a Christmas tree. I turn the lights on. Nobody else in the house awake. I turn the lights on. And, I, and the girl, they, they all put the Christmas tree up. Just you, where even a fat boy like me can walk all the way around it. And I went around and I was looking at ornaments. And we got ornaments going all the way back to the 70s. And I, I got ornaments with my kids' faces on them. I'm looking at some of them and said, 1980. Got some go back when y'all were just little. You was going like that, like you always do when you picture something. And I think, hey. And I got to thinking, God has blessed me. And I'm getting to see this tree one more time. All these ornaments. One more. And I'm not worth it, God. Because I was thinking about preaching here today. And I agonized with God. I said, God, please touch somebody's heart because they're lost and they need to be saved. And I have an agony for you. And you say, you preach too long. I got an agony for you because I don't want people to go to hell. See, of all the folks in this room that really deserve to go to hell, I know I deserve to go to hell more because of the garbage I've done. And some of the stupid stuff I did after I got saved. God should have let somebody shoot me. But he didn't. And sometimes I think the only reason he didn't is so that maybe Sunday after Sunday I can tell some other crazy nut house, you need to get saved. Go get saved. Don't gamble with your life. Don't gamble. And trust me, God saves gamblers. Praise the Lord. Quentin, ain't that right? Me and Quentin know how to deal. Hand the cards, don't we, brother? God will save you no matter what. He saved Rahab, he'll save you. Yeah, he saved Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was probably the greatest woman in the world. He'll save you no matter how good you are. Right? Because we all need to be saved. Amen. Father, have your way. Touch these dear people's lives. Lord, this is all the agony I know I don't know anything else to say. I'm not, I'm not good at it. I, I get depressed with myself sometimes. Lord, I think I've told them that, that your son died for them. And if they'll repent, trust him, you'll save them. And Father, for whatever I haven't told them, I know your Holy Spirit will reveal it to them if they'll just surrender to you. God, touch them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing? You come.